legend of Junior Johnson. And this legend here is a country boy, Junior Johnson, one of the biggest copper steel operators of all times up in Engel Hollow near North Wilkesboro in northwestern North Carolina, and grows up to be a famous stock car racing driver. As the motor thunder begins to lift up through him like a sigh, and his eyeball delays over, and his hands reach up and there, riding the rim of the bowl, soaring over the ridges, forever rousing the good old boys, hard charging, up with the automobile into their America, and the hell of those archaeosclerotic old boys trying to hold on to the whole pot with arms of cotton seersucker. Junior. Arnold Gingrich founded Esquire in 1933. It's now a thousand issues old. It was a magazine that was begun with the mission to be all things to all men, which is an impossibly broad mandate. And along the way, it has found its niche as a magazine of tremendously ambitious writing. They sent magazine writers out into the land who were having an effect on the culture with every piece. And Wolf was one of them. And they came back with, you know, trophies. And that was the place where the trophies were displayed. Esquire magazine was always at the top and always had the greatest photography. They loved to explore. They got the most out of the visual, and they also obviously got the most out of the words. The kind of pieces that Esquire did in the 60s and 70s aren't really like anything that's being done now. 1960s in America, we were going from being a naive to a more wise and culture. And that's where people like Tom Wolfe come in. I was from Richmond, Virginia. My father had a farm, but inside I realized that farming and, and I never really took. Tom Wolfe is probably the most skillful writer in America. I mean by that that he can do more things with words than anyone else. One thing that's really important to know about Wolfe, he's an outsider in his own world. I mean, he's up there in New York with a chip on his shoulder because he's from the South skeptical of a lot of things, including the politics of literary culture. Your fate as a writer is in the hands of the critical medium. I don't think you can afford to be worried about things like that. There was a bright line at the time between literature and journalism. Writers like Wolf just were rebelling against it. He just went and created what we now recognize as the new journalism. The idea was you're bringing to journalism the techniques of fiction interior monologues, dialogue, and the sort of the insistent desire to dramatize and make it big. But I, I really see my role in anything of this sort, and I, in fact I always have, as, as, as to discover. Junior Johnson, a bull-shouldered 225-pounder, was born a mountain farm boy in the Rhonda community of Wilkes County, North Carolina. He was a good old boy working for Esquire as an editor who knew all about Junior Johnson. Frankly, I had never heard of Esquire at that time. And so I took this assignment to go write a story about Junior Johnson. It was very hot standing. Tom and I had never worked before together, but Esquire thought we'd be a good combination. And we went down to North Carolina, and I learned that Tom, like many New Yorkers at that time, couldn't drive, and I had to do the driving. When I finally got a look at North Wilkesboro, where Junior lived, I realized this was something that was real Southern. It was probably in the 90s, and Tom had that signature heavy white suit on and a fedora sort of stuck on the side of his head. I thought he was a crank, to tell you the honest truth. Wool suit on and hit 101 temperature. <laughs> it was just funny. I was dressed fairly low rent by New York standards, but uh, I was an alien creature when I got there. I admired his idea that 
you got to get yourself out of your office and off the telephone and get out into the world and see what's going on. And if you go do that, it is amazing what you will find. You'll find yourself on Mars. So it's a lot of pride in who makes the best whiskey, and who's got the best liquor card, and stuff like that, you know. Junior took a chance letting Tom Wolfe into his world because most of the other people around Junior are very suspicious of people from New York coming down to write about this. Well, Tom Wolfe walking around here, what? You go way out in the county in the middle of the night and get up on somebody's porch, they may have a shotgun to answer the door, but they'll ask a couple of questions before they shoot. But I don't consider that standoffish. I consider that being cautious. Hey, nobody lives in the mountain and don't know how to make whiskey. <laughs> I was, you know, like 16 years old, and I was hauling whiskey every night. I couldn't get enough of it. Good, good. The title of the piece, The Last American Hero, really comes from those origins. In other words, here's somebody who became a hell of a leather driver because he started out in his business for his father. You know, it's an absolutely fascinating subject. And it's one of the great things about Wolf as a writer. He goes into North Carolina, into Junior Johnson's world, who, like Wolf, was probably the most transgressive figure in his culture because he wanted to connect in a human way. And he discovered something in the vitality of the experience that he was able to transfer directly to the page. So I think it's safe to say the Junior Johnson story is absolutely the story where Wolf found his voice. 10 o'clock Sunday morning in the hills of North Carolina. Cars, miles of cars in every direction, millions of cars, pastel cars, aqua green, aqua blue, aqua beige, aqua buff, aqua dawn, aqua dusk, aqua aqua, aqua malacca, malacca laca, cloud lavender, assassin pink, rake cheek raspberry, nude strand, coral, honest thrill, orange, and baby fawn lust cream colored cars are all going to the stock car races. And that old mother in North Carolina sun keeps exploding off the windshields. Mother dog. It was like a festival. I was overwhelmed by it. The girls up on top of the cars and showing themselves off. Such a joy around you. Tom seemed to understand that. He never lost a particle of that feeling. He had a great day and a big day at the racetrack. I kind of showed him around garages and stuff. I didn't want him to run a story like we was all bootleggers and did down on sets. Southern stock car drivers all lined up in those two-ton mothers that go over 175 miles an hour. Fireball robbers, Freddie Lorenzen, Ned Jarrett, Richard Petty, and the hardest of all the hard chargers, one of the fastest automobile racing drivers in history. Yes, Junior Johnson. There are two qualities in Junior Johnson that he wants to bring to the surface. One is he's got incredible nerve, incredible physical courage, of a sort that you just don't see in the rest of the country. It's of this place. And the other big thing is he's uh, hostile to authority. What Wolf does is he gets you feeling that when you're watching Junior Johnson in a NASCAR race, the cops are right behind you. Great God Almighty, smoking blue gumballs. There goes Junior Johnson. The huge mountaineer, Junior Johnson. This is the man they say who knows no fear. I uh, was crazy, I think. <laughs> I've never been scared in a race car, any other kind of car, because I thought I was good enough driver to handle it. And I was. 
stock car racing, a lot depended on how fast you were willing to drive into a curve. And that just became sheer animal daring. It's the rural southern code of honor and courage that has produced these the most daring men in sports. Wolf saw in this really clearly, it's not about the money. What's really going on here is southern male courage in a very pure form. There's this place in America that has a 18th century kind of attitude towards courage. An idea of courage that has vanished from the rest of the society. Where people define themselves by their insouciance in the presence of death. Valor is peculiar to this place. The neighborhood of Junior Johnson and this race car driver in the backwoods of Appalachia is an expression of the valor. That's at the bottom of this thing. The race car driving is almost just, it's the froth on top. Junior Johnson really was a heroic figure to people in the western part of North Carolina. And they raise a six-year-old boy up in their hands and say, now this here's Junior Johnson. You remember that now, you met Junior Johnson. The girls would come up to him and say, do my hand, Junior, do my hand, which meant write your autograph on the back of my hand. He's not mythical, he's just a decent guy. He's done very well, but he hadn't forgot who helped him do well. The proverbial good old boy. He was a big, big figure in the land of the good old boys. They'll come pouring out of the hills of Wilkes County to see good old Junior run. And you know, it's amazing. Only when I wrote this piece did I realize that these people are really not small town people. They're not dressed like hillbillies. They didn't listen to country music either. This was a new creature, the new good old boy from the new south who loves not to be a hillbilly anymore. That was me. Um, and so I started, why is this the way it ended up I realized that in the South, cars had a tremendous symbolic meaning. The meaning was you were getting away from that country life. The car meant everything. It was freedom, it was speed, it was excitement. In this cocktail of post-war, people hungry for cars, since the cars were essentially called stock cars, there was that perception that what was racing was the same that was in the showroom. And after every weekend race, you know, there'd be advertisements. Remember, every car in that lot was bought by an auto racing fan. What Detroit discovered was that thousands of good old boys in the South were starting to form allegiances to brands of automobiles, according to which were the hottest on the stock car circuits, the way they used to have them for hometown baseball teams. The South was one of the hottest car buying areas in the country. He was cognizant of the fact that this car culture just became this extension of what people wanted their lives to be. The whole thing was an expression of freedom from the old South. I thought it was very important to establish all of that and not just have an article about a great race car driver. That's what a visionary writer does. He's looking to understand a world in a way that's not caricatured, in a way that's entirely and wholly new. And so he's seeing that his subject is changing before his eyes. And so is the country. And it's through the prism of the world converging in North Carolina to do car racing. Yeah, Tom Wolfe was writing about the New South in 1965. I don't think anybody else was. He was uh, a literary person mingling with the masses. And a lot of Tom Wolfe's writing is saying to people, these people you think aren't worth paying attention to, they are worth paying attention to. And Junior Johnson was one of them. I didn't think that he would write the story that he wrote, but I thought it was an awesome story. Things change, people change, but you don't want to never forget how you was brought up. You'll remember it as long as you live. 
that article did that. A stubborn notion, a crazy notion. Yet Junior Johnson has followers who need to keep him symbolically riding through the nighttime like a demon. Madness. But Junior Johnson is one of the last of these sports stars who is not just an ace at the game itself, but a hero a whole people or class of people can identify with. Junior. Why, Junior Johnson, <laughs> Tom, as I live and breathe. Tom Wood, what are you doing, man? How you been getting along? Well, not badly. Yeah. Not badly. I'm still uh, vertical. You're right. That's half the battle. That's true. That's true. <laughs> come, come have a seat. Okay. Writers who have the power that Tom Wolfe has create characters in the culture. He turned Junior Johnson into a national celebrity. That's powerful. Your article in my bootlegging days <laughs> is the best thing ever happened for racing, especially NASCAR. I think I got more out of that than you did. <laughs> <laughs> well, that piece really did a, it did a lot for me. For one thing, it, uh, it opened up a world that outside of, at that time, outside of the South was, was not known very well. Right. So it opened a few eyes. People like Junior Johnson and Tom Wolfe, there was a force there focused on life and humanity. It was extraordinary. We was both an icon that did their own thing. Both of them was good things. <laughs> that, that fits the uh, name drafting, I think. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they just kind of stick with each other. Yeah, we, we've been friends from then on. I'll, 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 I'll accept that. <laughs> <laughs> we remember this story because it had a big beating heart at its center. It wanted to understand and love its subject. It is by bridging that gap in culture, geography, and understanding that makes it as thrilling today as it was 50 years ago. The Junior Johnson story, one of the greatest stories Esquire has ever published. Thank you.